Good morning, Revolution, and welcome everybody to this week's show. Scott, what's up with you? Not much. Um, just uh, staying inside, trying chilling, to find curve. Chilling in place. Yep. Chilling in place. Chilling in like place. That. Yes, yes. And Michael, we got Michael uh, with us this morning from the great state of Ohio, a regular Buckeye from Columbus. Hey, Michael, are you from Columbus? I think you might be muted, buddy, so you might want to unmute yourself. If you oh, can. I'm good. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. I can yeah, hear you now. I, I've lived in Columbus most of my life, but I've lived okay. in the Dominican All Republic right. for a while. Yeah. Well, we hope everybody is staying healthy. Um, you know, physically distant, but communally and socially close. Well, we're here in New York. Uh, we got one hell of a crisis on our hands, Scott. The hospitals are being overwhelmed and the president is com totally acting like a complete fool and nincompoop, saying untruthful things, riffing on attacking reporters, attacking governors, you know, it just goes on and on. And the governor, uh, Cuomo, is competing with other, other governors for respirators, and the federal government is competing with the governors. It's, it's anarchy. Scott, what the hell is oh, going on? Well, I mean, I'm not sure that it's, that it's anarchy. It's, it's certainly a, a, a crisis within you know, within the capitalist state, in addition to an economic crisis and a- I think it's anarchy. I'm sorry, it's anarchy of production, it's anarchy of distribution. What else can you call it? You call that oh, rationality? Yeah, no, fair enough. Uh, the usual <laughs> the usual anarchy of capitalism, but but intensified to a, um, to a truly horrifying and, and even more life-threatening degree. It's madness. And by the way, we're having a town hall Sunday night, folks, at eight o'clock. Uh, working class solidarity, taking care of our class and our country. We've got to take care of ourselves on the one hand, but we've also got to place demands uh, on the uh, public. No, on the administration and the ruling class. The public has to place the goddamn demands, you know? Um, Michael and uh, young people are as upset as anybody else about this uh, thing. And I hope that there's a lot of uh, organizing taking place. Um, you were uh, at the Ohio University until recently. How were the students reacting to it there? And teach and professors. Well, from what I understand is a lot of them are upset with having to pay rent when they're no longer attending school there. A lot of them who have gone back to live in their homes with their families, not only in Ohio, but across the country, they're still having to pay rent, even though uh, the students living in the dorms have gotten the refunds and such. But the ones uh, who are, tend to be juniors and seniors in their last two years of school, plus graduate students, they have to continue to pay rent, sometimes uh, two rents if they you know, move out of the city to, to stay safe and they go back home to where they live. And so it's very very unfair and that's why you see such a large um, support for rent strikes or a demand for freezing rent across the country because people young and old you know we can't afford to pay rent if we're not getting paid we're not going to work and this th that brings out a really important uh, point as well about the the kind of demands that we can organize around and fight on and maybe even win in a in a period like this um, because uh, the rent strike and the, the demand for a moratorium on uh, a suspension of rent payment and mortgage payment and a moratorium on evictions started off as, as something that, that a lot of people considered a fringe, you know, unrealistic demand, um, but it's been pushed and pushed. And now, uh, I think yesterday or the day before, the Washington Post ran an article of which the title was, the working class has, um, has a new demand uh, no more rent. Um, there you go. Which, which I mean, little. I mean, they put they 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 talked about rent strikes and the the need for rent relief and also the fact they use the working class in in a correct way in in the title of the article. It shows the the amount of movement that's possible. Well, that's an interesting. Uh, question because these are issues that both have theoretical and practical 
implications, uh, Scott and Michael. And I just read a, a very interesting article in Monthly Review, which uh, deals with the uh, COVID-19 virus and the issue of capital circulation. Um, and the authors are arguing that you know, the Imperial College studies, uh, the models that are being projected, they're arguing that those are based on very narrow assumptions, you know? You know, that's where they get the estimate that 200,000 people are gonna die in the United States during this pandemic with social distancing and uh, stay at home policies. Um, but they say that, you know, that may not be, uh, that there are underlying assumptions in that model that don't take into account the issues of uh, uh, the transmission of the diseases uh, via uh, capital circulation, uh, don't take into account uh, issues with respect to trade, and don't take into account uh, what may be uh, unusual patterns of circulation of the virus itself. And they argue that because of the austerity policies with regard to the privatization and cutbacks in, in private and public health in the United States, that the system of health care in general, uh, Scott, is not capable of managing the crisis no matter what, even with this rolling approach to providing care uh, in relationship to social distancing as the crisis unfolds. And they, and they bring out a really interesting um, idea, which is that if we look for the, the origin of the virus, we can't just look at Wuhan. We have to look at uh, a, the, a structure the, the, or a set of structures within capitalism, which include uh, privatization, and austerity and you know the failure to um, regulate production uh, and also and I think what they what they specifically emphasize in the in the latter half of the article uh, is the way in which agribusiness right uh, has aggravated this uh, uh, disease and puts us at, at a substantially higher risk of future pandemics because uh, as um, agriculture has been, as food production has been uh, commodified, and as the, the uh, sort of, as you said, the, the, the circuits of, of capital have changed within um, agribusiness, we've lost a lot of the kind of built in ways of uh, checking the spread of diseases. So when you don't breed anim your food animals on site, when you raise them where you're not breeding them, you lose the, uh, the natural selection that allows immunity to evolve to uh, diseases. And when you have the huge agricultural market cities in peri-urban zones, that uh, also changes. So uh, that, that makes, that concentrates um, uh, contagion. Um, Not only that, but then there's the issue of deforestation. Mm -hmm. And the and the uh, entry of uh, unusual pathogens, viruses, and bacteria into the uh, ecosystem, you know, through um, through issues of uh, people selling exotic foods and all different kinds of things, uh, and uh, and and they're selling it in, in, in mass ways. In fact, I was in South Africa once. And they had a big restaurant, you know, where you ate game meat, you know. Um, and I hope I didn't pick up anything uh, then, but that was. I went to one of those in ago. Canada. Huh? I went to one of those in Canada. Yeah, bu bush yeah. meat, they call it, you know. So you was, you know, eating crocodile, alligator, gazelle, you know, various other uh, animals of the uh, African uh, savanna. Uh, so um, uh, these, these, these products are going into the ecosystem, going into the food chain. Um, and the viruses are jumping from um, what were uh, habitats that were unexplored and unused into uh, the uh, commodity production system, into the agribusiness system, and we're eating it. 
I think they even said that it's coming from bats, uh, uh, Michael. You're eating bat shit, and 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 the uh, it's infecting our lungs in a, in, in a more than symbolic way. So this is some deep uh, shit. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? And so, but they put forward a series of uh, solutions, which going back to your point, Scott, may seem radical, but if you think about it, maybe not. Like they're calling for socializing the hospital system, right? They say Spain did that just recently in relationship to the uh, crisis, Scott. Mm -hmm. uh, they said that we need to socialize the pharmaceuticals that are needed in order to treat the disease, you know? They said that uh, we need to uh, immediately, without further delay, uh, uh, socialize the, the industries that are responsible for, for providing the gowns and masks and gloves that are necessary for the frontline workers to do their jobs. To say and I think that, that term socialize is, is, is a really important one and one that I like a lot better than nationalize, which yeah, is definitely. one people default to a lot of the time. Um, because to my, what, you know, even, even Trump has floated the idea of, of nationalizing this or that, you know, part of the economy. But we, you know, as you can imagine, uh, a nationalization of the pharmaceutical sector under uh, extreme right uh, fascist uh, control would not be a socialization. It would not be for the people. It would not be for the working class. It would be to the the, the premise of it would be preserving the uh, profits of the uh, of the companies and ensuring their solvency. Interesting. What do you like, Michael? Socialize and nationalize. I think I prefer socialize just because you know uh trump's going around calling himself a nationalist he's done that as his rally <laughs> um, but we also have to consider that in spain where i think after italy it's you know the worst in europe they do have um you know their socialist and communist party working in a coalition so it's a little bit easier for uh, the people's uh, demands to be met however even though COVID-19 is the virus and capitalism is the crisis we can all agree on that there are capitalist countries who as the, the monthly review article was stating, um, such as South Korea even, who has dealt with this crisis a little bit more because they've been able to put politics aside and put people before profits. Of course, this is not something magic that, or, you know, that comes out of the heart, the good hearts of the capitalists, but it's that the people make demands and the, peop and, you know, the government say, all right, well, we better give them what they want or else it's going to be you know, our next. You know, people aren't going to pay their rent. They're going to go on strike. They're not going to show up for work. Um, and so those demands have to be uh, made. And it's nothing radical. In fact, last night I was on um, uh, a call, a Zoom call, with Angela Davis and uh, Naomi Klein, which was, it was an event organized by the rising majority. And they were talking about how the COVID-19 pandemic as a whole really shows us how the what we understand as the nation state is no longer functioning as it should the whole the concept of oh immigration you know keep the immigrants out you know they because they they don't come here legally covid 19 doesn't care about that you get sick no matter who you are rich poor you know young old undocumented or documented so that's something that we have to think about going forward because this is going to be a global it is a pandemic but now we are facing a global economic crisis of, of capitalism. And with the nation state, it's, it's extremely, we're, we're in a really uh, tense position or, or a, a difficult position because, you know, I, I think you're right that um, the, the, the structure of the nation state is losing its primacy as the, you know, the, the, organize, the way capitalism is organized. Um, at the same time, um, it's not losing its, its power um, as a, or it's, it's, um, it's status. Like we, we have nation states in crisis, uh, which, which is very dangerous. Um, so we have to, we're, we're still in a situation where we have to respond to this, this global threat, um, on a, a national basis. We haven't yet built the structures for, um, you know, operating politically in, in a, an age as global as ours.
Well, that's a very interesting concept. I'm not sure I agree with it. You know, um, there were uh, a number of uh, economists uh, who put forward the ideas in the 1990s and the early 2000s about global capitalism and the reduction and the importance of the nation state and all of that kind of thing, which is kind of a hearkening back to Karl Kotsky and the notion of ultra imperialism. And of course we see with respect to Trump and company, a move in the opposite direction, you know, away from these international associations, away from the European e economic community, a pushing of so-called America first. Well, that's exactly the, that's exactly, I mean, I think, I think that, that dovetails exactly with what, you know, Michael was, was proposing about the nation state, which is, you know, you have the, the nation state losing its kind of organic function if you can call it that. Um, and then this section of the ruling class that rather than, uh, rather than adapt to that, that increasing globalization doubles down on the nation state in this reactionary way, trying to sort of re, reinvigorate this, this form that's, you know, that's losing its its importance. That's how I would see it anyway. An interesting idea, which we will have to uh, debate further. Um, speaking of debate, we had an interesting one last week, Scott, uh, about uh, the issue of, uh, you know, Stalin and Mao and all of that. And it's uh, gotten a lot of uh, traction. People are interested in uh, what we're talking about. Uh, it seems to me, though, that we didn't dig deeply enough into it because essentially what we're talking about uh, with respect to these issues is the difference between what we've called middle class or petty bourgeois radicalism, you know, on the one side and Marxism on the other. What do you think? Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, and, you know, we, when we talk about petty bourgeois radicalism, middle class radicalism, I mean, the, the thing that sort of defines it for me is um, kind of a, a leaping to conclusions about um, the, the immediacy of revolution and the, the uh, how close the, um, you know, the state is to complete failure. So, you know, it's very easy in a time like this to say that, you know, we're in this profound crisis and, and capitalism is on its heels and we need to, you know, um, seize the initiative and, and you know... General strike! Ge uh, it could be a general strike. It could be, you know... Um, revolution tomorrow. Revolution tomorrow. It could Go be... for it. Form a, we're going to form a, uh, you know, sort of a revolutionary... Van, uh, vanguard revolutionary commune and, and organized from there. Dual power. <laughs> or or uh, the, the notion of dual power, like, the, you know, the state can't take care of uh, our, our needs, either politically or, or socially or economically. So we're going to set up other institutions that will be the basis of a new state. Those don't take into account the, the daily existence of working class people. The fact that, you know, um, people still have to put food on the table and they still have to, you know, and people, I think anyway, most people want what they would consider a normal life, right? Mm -hmm. um, people, people are not, um, people don't wake up in the morning, most people anyway, and say, whoo, I, I hope everything gets torn down today and we can rebuild a new state from the ashes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my sense anyway. I, don't know. I, you know, I really appreciate this uh, conversation, this topic in particular, because um, there is a very large movement out there. I don't know if it's a unified movement, um, but it's big on the internet. It's big amongst young, from what I've seen, um, young white intellectuals and um, college educated uh, people on the internet who read about these ideas. And they believe that it is, it's very necessary and immediate, as you were saying. They think that, um, you know, by reading Mao, you know, or, you know, some other 
uh, maybe an anarchist or something, they think that that can immediately happen tomorrow because they're so frustrated with the system. And I think uh, many of us on the left sometimes tend to forget that we live inside a bubble sometimes. We surround ourselves with reading certain articles and you know, certain theory that we're, we get out of touch with the working class. And that, I think that's what I really appreciate about, uh, about our party is that we're so in touch with the working class because we understand that, yes, even though the economy is failing right now, we have this global pandemic making people, you know, um, apply for unemployment and such. It does not mean that the masses of people are demanding a socialist revolution. They're not. There's many people who support Bernie Sanders and that they support the idea of socialism, you know, in terms of healthcare and such. But in terms of workers ready to seize the means of production, we're not quite there yet. And that's why we really have to continue to push uh, to unite workers around the issues. What are the issues? What are the demands we're making in light of this crisis with the upcoming um, elections this year, right? If they're happening, you know, Trump's talking about can canceling them. Um, but we have to unite around that. And that's how we can get organized and radicalized, if you will. Um, because it's not going to happen tomorrow. We have to be realistic about this and understand where we are in the struggle. So a placing of long-term demands as immediate ones is one feature of uh, a middle-class radicalism. What about kind of a workerist approach? Class, 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 but not seeing gender or not seeing the democratic uh, struggle for equal rights for LGBTQ people, or not seeing nationality and race uh, as central organizing uh, features. Scott, is that also? Uh, you know, I, I, will, I had not, I had never thought of that as a, as a particularly, you know, petty bourgeois. What about Trotskyism? Is it uh, that orientation? Well, Look at the 1619 debate. Well, I, I mean, I think, you know, the the rejection of um, democratic struggle uh, by by some people in the Trotskyist movement, um, you know, it, it's true. It happens. It's not what I consider or what I would see as the the kind of central point of of, of Trotskyism uh, or the, the particularly petty bourgeois aspect of it, which has mm -hmm. more to do with the you know. Um, the fetishization of, of kind of bottom up spontaneous action, you know, don't trust union leadership, don't trust whatever. Um, and, and the, yeah, I don't know. I, Michael, what do you think? Let me, let me, let me pose the question even a little more, more sharply. What about the, and, and we're very sympathetic to the Sanders movement. Don't get me wrong. We're very sympathetic to his placing of the issue of socialism. But what about some of the negative aspects of their initial reluctance to address the special issues of, uh, of a race and gender and to put forward platform issues that address them? Is that a feature of middle-class radicalism? I think I see, yeah, I think I see where you're also coming from, Joe, just because that, we face the problem sometimes of being what we call class reductionists, um, where we say Whoa. class and we don't take into consideration that the LGBT community are also members of the working class. You know, there's many LGBT workers in the workforce. Uh, race, you know, the workforce is very diverse. And so when we just say race or uh, class, class, class before all else, I think we're really um, excluding um, all these different factors that play a role in the class struggle. We use the word intersectionality. Yes, everything's connected, but it's also part of class struggle, the struggle for democracy, the struggle for, you know, the struggle against racism, the struggle for LGBT rights, the struggle for immigrant rights. That's all part of class struggle. So we can't just say, you know, with uh, socialism and revolution, all that's going to get cleared up. You know, that doesn't go away overnight. So, you know, it's a constant. You're right, but everything can't be reduced to class. There are some all class issues too. That is to say, racism affects all black people, whether you're rich or poor. Discrimination against LGBTQ and women, all women face sexism, all LGBTQ people face homophobia. So it's class, but a, a, a Marxist approach also sees the democratic broader issues. You can't reduce everything to class. And um, again, I, you know, I, I agree yeah. entirely with that. Um, uh, and and the, the and 
class reductionism or, or economism are, um, are ah. problems. But I don't, again, I, I guess I, I haven't really, uh, I've, I've never thought of them as particularly petty bourgeois trends. Within. Economism, that's another important, is it a feature of middle class radicalism? I think it is. Okay. Uh, and a step away from a consistent working class uh, uh, Leninist approach, uh, if you will, to politics today. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. I think we've gone even over time. And I think that uh, we're going to get a, hope, a lot of feedback before we go. We want to refer you back to our website at cpusa.org. We've got a whole section on the coronavirus crisis. Please check it out. We invite you back to our town hall on Sunday, 8 o'clock. It will be streamed live here on our Facebook. Uh, you can go to our website to get the link for the live stream on Zoom as well. Um, that does it for us, folks. So, Scott? Michael, have a good weekend. Stay physically distant, but communally and socially close. And Be healthy, we'll... comrades. Stay healthy. Take care. Bye-bye.